Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord of God, You were, with signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were the Eden, the garden of God. Every previous stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your inquiries in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries, so I brought fire out from your midst. It consumed you, and I turned you to ashes on the earth in sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are appalled at you, and you have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in and welcome back to a new chapter of the Insidious Agenda podcast. As always, I'm your host Nick, and on this week's multifaceted episode, we're going to explore the origin of Lucifer, the hierarchy of hell, the history of demonology and exorcism. Ensure you're subscribed to this podcast so you don't miss out on any of our weekly episodes. Now it's time to turn out your lights close your eyes, let things go quiet, and just listen for a moment. Maybe you're alone. Maybe you're not. Now, follow along to the sound of my voice, and let's get into our story. Through the study of demonology and its concepts, one name is known to all. Whether a person is devoutly religious or merely acquainted with popular culture, they know the name for the Prince of Darkness. To some, it's the Devil or Lucifer. To others, Satan. There will be a heavy focus on the Christian interpretation of Lucifer in this episode. And our episode begins with determining how a supreme entity like Lucifer could have fallen from grace to the point of being cast out of heaven and being the primal force behind the usurpation of God. From the book of Genesis, when God originally created the world, it was determined to be good. Before everything and time itself, there was no concept of a heaven or hell or even angels or demons. The first time we come across the concept of a dark deity, it's in the third chapter of Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were the original creations of God in human form. 
Adam, was the first to be created. God fashioned Adam in his image, creating him from the earth and breathing life into him by way of his nostrils. God next created Eve by way of a rib from Adam. Originally, Eve was created as Ezer Kenegdo, or a helper corresponding to him. She was created with the name Isha, or woman, and it was said that Adam received her with joy. Adam and Eve were placed into the Garden of Eden, a place born of all creation and purely non-violence. They were told that they may eat the fruits from the trees in the garden, but are prohibited from tasting the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They are eventually set upon by a serpent who tempts Eve into tasting the forbidden fruit. She does so, offering it to Adam, who also tastes it. This transgression would unfortunately incur the wrath of God, leading to all three beings being cursed. Adam is given a lifetime of hard labor, followed by death. Eve is given the pain of childbirth and subordination to Adam. The serpent is forced to crawl around on its belly and becomes the enemy of Adam and Eve. God then gave clothes to Adam and Eve and banished them from the garden unless they eat the fruit of a second tree, the tree of life, which would allow them to live forever. God then drove them from the garden and installed cherubs and the ever-turning sword to guard the entrance. Lucifer, in Roman folklore, translates as Lightbringer. It was originally used as the name of the planet Venus. He was said to be the son of Aurora and Cephalus, and was the father of Sikhs. His mother, Aurora, is symbolic of many goddesses that are associated with the light of dawn. During the Roman period, Lucifer was not regarded as a god or even a deity. There was no normal mythology surrounding him, specifically, although there was much that referenced the planet Venus. It wouldn't be until the time of Cicero, who pointed out that because the father and mother of Lucifer, Sol and Luna were deities, that Lucifer must be one as well. One of the earliest stories that exists similar to Lucifer's, is that of the Sumerian goddess Inanna. She was also associated with the planet Venus, and many of her actions, specifically in the story Inanna and Shuka Latuda, or Inanna's descent into the underworld, are similar to that of Lucifer. Many similarities can also be seen in the Babylonian story of Etana, who strived for the highest seat among the star gods but was cast down by the supreme deity on the mountain of the gods. Possibly the most common story that parallels that of Lucifer is the Canaanite story of Attar. Attar attempted to occupy the throne of Baal, but was unsuccessful. In his shame, he descended into the underworld where he would become its ruler. The concept of fallen angels even predates the coming of Christianity, but there was no real context for these beings in existence at that time. In the Hebrew book of Enoch, the being Azazel and his host of angels had come to earth in human form in order to teach forbidden arts, which would end up being the originations of sin. It would be in that work, the apocalypse of Abraham, that Azazel, the magnificent being, would be referred to as the antithesis of God. This work brought in the concepts of a kingdom of God in heaven and the devil's kingdom on earth, tying in the story of Adam and Eve. When Christianity rose, it disputed the Hebrew idea. Christianity believed that the fall of angels existed prior to the coming of humans. The devil, in this religion, is considered to be in rebellion of God and possesses the temporary power of the world of man. It's the Christian belief that the devil was created good, but at some point, by his own volition, had chosen evil and was subsequently cast out of heaven. The book of Revelation would result in a battle in heaven in which the archangel, Saint Michael, would vanquish Satan, causing him to be cast out of heaven along with the remainder of his following, the evil angels. 
Through the works of St. Augustine, the devil was depicted as the embodiment of pride, which was how he existed through periods of medieval Christianity. The notions of evil simply being the absence of good were rejected by theologians in favor of evil representing a spiritual struggle and pain. There had begun to exist the concept of Lucifer being a fallen angel banished to hell, while Satan would be the one to execute his will. Christians also had begun to accept that anything sacred to pagans was in favor of the devil. Such pagan spirits like dwarves and elves became regarded as demons. It was also in the early Middle Ages when the concept of selling your soul to the devil would arise. The exchange of one's soul and the renouncing of faith were common beliefs. The devil, in Christian belief, would be able to be tricked by way of courage and common sense. Thus, at times, the devil became more of a comic relief figure in some versions of folklore. It wouldn't be until the time of Pope Gregory I who, along with the views of St. Augustine, would form the standard view of the devil. Gregory would describe him as the first creation of God. He was a cherub and a leader of angels. He had fallen from heaven because of his own will and his will being unjust. Another trait would be that the devil was also a great tempter who would only ever show humans the door to sin, but that human will would eventually be the cause of that sin. Around the 12th century, through the Catharism movement, came the concept of salvation. This belief outlined that evil people would suffer with the devil at the moment of resurrection, while those who were good would enjoy eternity in the light of Christ. It wasn't until the time of the Reformation in the 1400s that the devil would actually grow in power. He became increasingly known as a powerful entity who would misdirect servants of God. Unfortunately for certain groups, like Jews, witches, heretics, and lepers, that they became associated with the devil. Catholicism and Protestantism would also begin to accuse one another of spreading false doctrine. Thus, a shift began away from avoiding the seven deadly sins to the observation of the Ten Commandments. In modern times, the concept of both God and the devil has begun to fade from the view of many, although there are many who still believe. Largely, the devil exists as more of a psychological force. And the Catholic Church has also begun to focus some of its more contemporary teachings on the devil. Pope Paul VI acknowledged the existence of the smoke of Satan in 1972, and later, Pope John Paul II would state that the defeat of Satan is inevitable. A renewed focus in the devil was born in the early 2010s under Pope Francis, who would state that the devil is intelligence. He knows more theology than all of the theologians together. In 2013, he would state, the devil is a myth, but a real person. One must react to the devil as did Jesus, who replied with the word of God, with the prince of this world, one cannot dialogue. Dialogue is necessary among us. It is necessary for peace. Dialogue is born from charity and love. But with the prince, one cannot dialogue. One can only respond with the word of God that defends us. To the common listener, this might point directly at the rite of exorcism. Because, as covered previously in chapter 1, the ritual offers the expulsion of demons from their affected host. It's certain that the Catholic faith believes in the existence of the devil. The Lord's Prayer, or its common name, Our Father, even makes petition for deliverance from the devil. There is even an entire prayer invoking the name of Saint Michael for salvation in the form of the following. Saint Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power of God, cast into hell Satan 
and all evil spirits who roam throughout the world seeking the ruin of souls. Even the ritual of exorcism is a tool of the Catholic Church against the devil to break the hold of demonic possession. Through the exorcisms performed by Jesus, the Church was able to use the power of Christ for this purpose. The battle against the devil is ongoing, of course. As mentioned, during the 24th of May 1987 speech of Pope John Paul II at the Sanctuary of St. Michael the Archangel, the battle against the devil, which is the principal task of St. Michael the Archangel, is still being fought today because the devil is still alive and active in the world. The evil that surrounds us today, the disorders that plague our society, man's inconsistency and brokenness are not only the results of original sin, but also the result of Satan's pervasive and dark action. With the theology of Lucifer and his demons also comes the idea of hell. When you first think of hell, it probably looks like a desolate land of fire and brimstone where the souls of the damned are tormented beyond torment for all eternity. The idea of hell can be found across many religions with a good many variations. Again, for the purposes of this episode, we'll focus largely on the Western Christian concept of hell. There have been many iterations of the afterlife throughout history. It's largely a symbolic place of damnation where the souls of the wicked are punished for eternity. The Catholic view is that it's a fiery pit that lies somewhere beneath our feet and plays home to demonic forces. But hell itself is the removal of God, his love, and his mercy from the sinners who did not follow along his path, living a good moral life. In Christianity, it's believed that damnation to hell occurs at the very moment of death of a physical being. There are some denominations who break away from this ideology. The Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the soul sleeps with the body until the final day of judgment, at which time the righteous will be resurrected to heaven and the wicked will be annihilated. Roman Catholics in modern times believe it to be the absolute removal from God's love. Salvation from sin may be obtained through confession, the remission of sin paving the way for entry into God's kingdom. Unfortunately for those who are damned, escape from the torment of hell is impossible. Many theologians maintain that hell is the realm of Lucifer. In this context, he is the absolute ruler of hell, mainly portrayed as a red fire demon with two horns, carrying a pitchfork with a long, thin, triangle barbed tail. But of course, the devil cannot maintain the size of hell and all the spirits of the damned on his own. So some of the first entities we have to examine are the princes of hell. They are the ultimate authority. These beings are representative of the seven deadly sins. Of these, there are Lucifer, who represents pride, Belphegor, sloth, Mammon, greed, Beelzebub, gluttony, Satan, wrath, Leviathan, envy, and Asmodeus, lust. There also exist other princes in hell not included in the seven. These can be Dis, Azazel, Blial, Baal, Ramiel, Astaroth, and Abaddon. The seven princes were once great angels who lived in heaven. They would form special relationships with one another and often furthered this bond through deep discussion. They were praised, and often some of the most notable angels. When Lucifer declared open war against God, they would unite under his rebellion. They would eventually fall from some of the mightiest angels, such as Saint Michael. Many of them were badly injured in these battles and were scarred as a result. For this, they were cast out of heaven and into the abyss, the deepest and darkest place beyond imagination. The first two awakened from the fall were Lucifer, Beelzebub, and Satan, who were then regarded as the highest three of the seven princes. From the resulting impact of their fall from heaven, 
hell would be formed and the seven chosen as its first rulers. The need to form some kind of a government or hierarchy would present itself with the charismatic Lucifer establishing himself as the emperor of hell. Together with Satan and Beelzebub, they would form the satanic triumvirate with the other princes falling underneath them. Each prince of hell bears different characteristics, which we'll explore. The first and chief was Lucifer. We have covered much of the origin of Lucifer already in this episode, but he is the direct counterpoint to John the Baptist. It is said that he appears as a beautiful child to mortals, lending credit to the description of an antichrist. The second was Satan, the demon of witchcraft. He appears dressed in white robes with blonde hair and a human face. He is said to have been the original usurper of Job and is often invoked to assist with fertility. Then there exists Leviathan, the representation of envy, normally portrayed as a massive sea creature that was once an angel near God, now exists as the enemy of Saint Peter. He is associated with heresy and an advocate for those who speak out against the church. Leviathan is also the gatekeeper of hell. Next is Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. He is the opposition of St. Francis and embodies gluttony. He is recognized as the demon of false gods and is next in line for the throne of hell behind Lucifer. Often regarded as something akin to a chief of staff, he ensures that affairs of hell are in order. Then follows Asmodeus, the destroyer. He is the king of demons, although beneath some above him. He is often associated with the demon Lilith, his queen, and is depicted as having three heads, a human, a ram, and a bull. He is believed to block married couples from consummating their marriage and will often tempt husbands into being unfaithful, thus being the embodiment of lust. To understand the remainder of the hierarchy, we'll need to examine the compendium known as the Lemegeton Cavicula Salmonis, or more simply, the Lesser Key of Solomon. The compendium is broken into five different books. In the book Ars Gosha, there exists a list of 72 demons that reside in hell, and it outlines their ranks there. These 72 demons are believed to have been invoked by the King Solomon and confined to a bronze vessel in order to serve him for eternity. The Ars Gosha assigns a rank and title to each demon within the hierarchy and offers the signs and symbols that each is in servitude to. The book was originally translated into English in the year 1904 by Samuel Mathers and Alistair Crowley. The expanded knowledge base of demons, hell, and all matter in that area has piqued human curiosity. This has led to the popularization of study of demonology. As a pure, basic description, demonology is the study of demons or beliefs about demons and their hierarchy. This can also include entities of a non-human nature or souls that have never inhabited a physical body. Demons are normally categorized into four categories. Angels, which are normally based on Catholic representation who fell from grace. Then there's the malevolent genie, or better known as jinn, or familiars, or those involved with the formation of cults and then ghosts or other malevolent spirits, such as poltergeists. Often, these entities come into contact with humans. Sometimes, like in the case of Annalisa Michelle, this can lead to the phenomena known as demonic possession. Now, an individual does not start out in the possessed state, with entities much preferring to break down their victims before taking them over. From the account of Father Gabriel Amorth, the chief exorcist of the Catholic Church in the Vatican, Rome has identified this taking place in four separate stages. From his book, An Exorcist Tells His Story, the first stage 
is known as infestation. This is traditionally when an entity or entities will make their presence known in a home, leading to a haunted house type of atmosphere. The behaviors normally accompanying this are footsteps, voices, apparitions, furniture, or other objects that move about the home that can't be explained away by human interaction. As the phenomena progresses, it moves into stage two, or oppression. This is where the mischievous phenomena becomes physical. Attacks become physical on human bodies, and certain non-physical things can also set in. Often accompanying this stage is the onset of depression or severe anxiety, financial or unemployment problems, even relationship trouble. All of which can set in rather quickly and catch humans off guard. If it all seems to be happening at once, coupled with the phenomena outlined in stage one, it could signify the progression into the oppressive stage, largely meant to cut a victim off from their support network and isolate them before becoming much worse. The third stage is known as obsession. This is when the demonic entity and their attacks began to take over the body of the host and inhibit or restrict them from performing as they normally would. Physical manipulation of the body can set in, almost as though one is not in control of their own actions. The victim is unable to focus on living a normal life due to the progression and looming threat of being invaded by a demonic host. Quite often during this stage, the victim may contemplate suicide or may already be harming themselves. They lose self-autonomy and begin to sleep minimally or not at all. Father Amorth's belief was that the first three stages can be remedied by a minister or person of faith who knows what they are up against but that it's the fourth and final stage that only an exorcist can remedy. The final stage and deepest area of descent is possession. Contrary to religious belief and often how it's portrayed in Hollywood, a demon will never enter a victim's body and completely take over their soul. Free will is never removed in its entirety, but only severely restricted. The victim can lose control over their actions due to the physical, mental, and emotional damage that's suffered through the other three stages. Normally, the possession stage has telltale signs that can be attributed to it. A person may exhibit such things as superhuman strength, speaking in tongues they would never know or were never exposed to, aversion to religious objects or artifacts or knowledge of events the person never experienced. When locked in the stage of possession, only a trained exorcist can administer the rite by way of the Rituale Romanum and invoke the name of Jesus Christ to remove a demon from their afflicted host. These exorcists must be appointed by and receive special permission from the Catholic Church to perform this ritual. When it gets to this point, the process is known as a major exorcism. However, there also exists minor exorcisms. For more information on this specifically, refer to Chapter 1 and the Exorcism of Annalisa Michelle. This ritual is not entered into lightly or without the greatest consideration, especially in the modern day. Priests even have a specific set of guidelines for the determination of which events actually need an exorcism and which do not. It is crucially important for priests to determine if the person is suffering from an illness prior to attempting an exorcism. The ritual progresses through the use of prayer contained within the rite of exorcism. Priests may make use of any religious icons, sacraments, or relics in their battle with a demonic force. The name of God is also invoked to give power to the priests, often in the name of Jesus Christ and others within the hierarchy of heaven, such as Saint Michael the Archangel. Unlike their portrayed in Hollywood, these exorcisms are incredibly rare to be finished within minutes or even a day. 
Often, they form a series of processes that can take weeks or even years to remove a demon that may be deeply rooted in its victim. One of the strongest invocations is that which was previously read in this episode, St. Michael's prayer against Satan and the rebellious angels, which was brought into scripture by Pope Leo X. While that is the chief prayer in an exorcism, the rosary becomes the main weapon against the demon. From top to bottom, everything demonic can normally be tied together. From the clash of heaven and the falling of the angels into the abyss, to the rise of Lucifer and the creation of his hierarchy. And finally, to the coming into contact and possessing human hosts and the church driving them back into hell. Everything comes full circle. The affliction of demonic possession can certainly be a terrifying thing for any person to experience. While there may be no real understanding as to why one host is selected over another, it can become clear why the forces of Lucifer and his hellish legions lash out against God through the torment of his subjects on earth. They remain ever hateful for the defeat they were dealt in heaven and constantly remain a threat to us all until our final day of judgment. If you're hearing this message, that means you made it to the end of this week's story covering the origin of Lucifer, his hierarchy in hell, the study of demonology, and the rite of exorcism. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode, and I'd like to thank you very much for listening. For more information about the podcast, please visit our link tree in the show notes. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and follow our social media accounts so you don't miss any of our exciting stories to come. If you liked the episode, please tell a friend about the Insidious Agenda podcast. If you would like to show your support, donations can be made to our PayPal account in the link tree. So please come back next week for a hybrid true crime episode and the head-splitting tale of Lizzie Borden and her now haunted home. New episodes are released every Tuesday at 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But for now... It's time to close the cover of the Insidious Agenda. I'll see you again next week.